All of a sudden, everything is pouring in from the garden. We have a lot of ground to cover in this video with all the tomatoes, raspberries, squash, and much more. But first, we're gonna start with the onions and garlic that are on our porch. We have onions that are curing. I would like to get everything cleared off so that I can have this table free for all the tomatoes that are coming in. The way that you can know when your onions are ready to harvest is once about half of your patch, the tops have fallen over. And I like to just go through and like push the other tops down because I like to just harvest them all at one time. Once you've pulled all of your onions, you can just brush the dirt off a little bit and lay them out in a nice, sunny, well-ventilated spot. Onions are okay in the sun to cure. It's actually a good thing if they're in the sun to cure. I lay my onions over here where they get partial sun during some of the day and then shady ventilation during the rest of the day. You wanna leave your onions laying out to dry and cure in the sun for a week. And once you can see that like the whole onion is nice and crispy and dry, for sure this stem right here, and then you just take them and I like to just clean them up a little bit like this. And then you cut about right there. I like to leave some of that stem on there. The onions that will store the best are onions with a nice skinny top that bends over. It's almost like it crimps off the air. You just know that the stem is very dry inside and those onions will store very well. It's onions like this and like this is a really nice onion. Obviously it's nice and big and everything, but you can see that like this is still very green and squishy inside. These onions will just simply rot a lot faster in storage. So often onions that I can just tell aren't gonna store as long, I'll use right away. To be clear, you don't wanna take this papery stuff off. By cleaning them up, I just kind of brush dirt and stray stuff off. After you have cut the tops off of these onions, you can see they're still a little bit green and wet inside some of them. You want to lay these out in a well-ventilated spot, not in the sun anymore but you wanna lay them out to dry for another two weeks. That really ensures that this stem dries out, kind of heals over, and then they're ready to go down in your root cellar. You can also braid your onions, but honestly, I don't take the time to braid my onions. It just takes way too long. I would rather snip the tops off and throw them into crates than braid them all. I am wanting to put my onions down here for their last two week cure. So I need to get these garlics out of the way. And first of all, I'll just admit like my garlic this year was a complete and utter failure. I planted them in a place where I had my rhubarb last year. And because we've had a rhubarb there for like, I don't know, four or five years. So sadly we ended up taking out most of our rhubarb patch. I just left one plant. We have not composted it and stuff and so the soil is very hard clay like and I just didn't think about it this spring when I planted it so it did not get very big it still tastes delicious but it's not very big and I don't think it's gonna store very well so I'm gonna be using most of this stuff for all of my preserving all of my tomato sauces and stuff so that it for sure won't go to waste you want to let it dry up on your porch for one to two weeks once it's nice and dry like this stuff is, you can see that it's just, it's completely dried out. You wanna leave about an inch on there, and then you also want to snip the roots off. Last year we planted way too many onions and we ended up wasting a couple crates full because they sprouted before we could eat them all. But this year I decided to plant not quite so many. And now this honestly looks like it's not quite enough, but that's okay. This won't make or break us. And I have already set aside a bunch of the smaller onions to use for sauces and things like that. Like I've already made sauces. So some of them are already preserved as well. Michelle got that table cleared off so we can put tomatoes up there. And then that area over over there where the onions were, we need to put butternut squash. We're gonna go pick those in a little bit, so I'm gonna get this stuff all cleaned up. So we've got a space to put them to cure. What a sweet husband, he's sweeping the porch. <laughs> Some things that we pull out of the garden, we don't wanna put on the compost pile because it's diseased or whatever, but this is just fine. This will turn into compost. Hey, there's a decent amount of them in there. They're kinda of little. As you can see here, our butternut squash are looking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. kidding. They look terrible, so we're just gonna take all of the butternut squashes inside to cure on the porch. I wouldn't keep this one. <laughs> this is probably about the nicest one we got, which that is actually a pretty decent one, but when you cut these things off with these awesome scissors here, you wanna leave at least a little bit of the stem on there. I actually think we got a pretty nice crop of these. 
Yeah, it's better than we did last year. We got like nothing last year. And I mean, we don't eat like tons and tons and tons of these. But it's we more could just have like more pies. pumpkin pie if we had more butternut squash. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, the bugs are so gross. I literally picked tons and tons and tons of eggs. like And swept up bugs. And swept up so many bugs. I do not even understand how there can still be so many. One thing that I am very pleased about is that none of my cucumbers, squash, anything like that got powdery mildew. And I really feel like the secret was this spray that I have right here. It's called Oxidate. And I got it from the Berlin Seed Catalog. In the Berlin Seed Catalog, it's called Zeratol. And it is, oh, bugs. It says it's one of the absolute safest organic fungicides that can be used. So I'm really excited about this product. I think this is the first year in my gardening experience that I have not struggled with powdery mildew in my garden. See now what I'm afraid of is like where are these bugs going to go now once we pull these plants up. What I wish is that we had some kind of chicken tractor that fit directly on top of our raised beds because we could put a couple of chickens in here and they would go nuts which i am planning to do i want those to be ready possibly to put on here sometime this fall really i was hoping to <laughs> you're putting it directly on the porch <gasps> if you want some good laughs just go to the reels on our instagram and read the comments on the one where michelle dumped broccoli on our porch Let's just say it's amazing how ignorant and rude some people are. Here is my basil bush. I made these meatballs the other night with pesto and cream. They were absolutely amazing. And so I decided I'm gonna come out here and I'm gonna harvest a whole bunch of basil and put it in the food processor with some olive oil and make some amazing pesto ice cubes that I can pull out throughout the winter. The more you cut down your basil, the more bushy it will get. So don't be afraid of like cutting it down. It'll just get more beautiful. We use tons and tons of thyme. I use thyme to make steaks and chicken, and I also love it on sweet potato fries and even just white potato fries. Organic spices are actually super expensive. So this year I decided to grow thyme and see if I can avoid buying thyme from the grocery store this year. Here is a rack of thyme that I had down on my drying rack. I put all of my herbs on a screen and Cody made a nice rack for me to put the screens into as a drying rack. This is a batch that I put in a few weeks ago that I am trying to get all the stems out of. I'll be honest, thyme is a little bit more tedious than some of the other herbs because it has such fine, tiny little leaves. So I'm just kind of going like this and the leaves kind of fall off. Here's the thyme that I gathered today then. I'm just gonna put it on this rack and put it downstairs in my basement and in a couple weeks it will be dry. I brought this basil in from the garden and I washed it and put it through a salad spinner. I'm gonna put this into my food processor with a little bit of oil. I do realize that for normal pesto, you're supposed to add Parmesan cheese and pine nuts, but for this, I'm just going to pop this in here with some olive oil and it'll add a fresh pop to pasta and things like that. I don't have ice cube trays, so I'm just going to improvise because I really don't wanna get ice cube trays just for this. I'm gonna lay out some parchment paper and just put blobs of it on there and see if that'll work. The next thing we wanna harvest is our sweet potatoes and we've got four raised beds full of them here. The second one there is a variety called Vardaman. It's more of a bush variety. Those, the amount of days that needs to be done, they might not quite be done yet, but this variety here is called Covington. And these should be completely done. And we really need, hey, there's a sweet potato. <laughs> we really need to dig these and check those to see if they're done yet because we have found if we leave them in too long, they just start cracking and they start looking really weird and nasty and they don't store as well then either. So really wanna get these in. I don't think we're gonna get these all dug today, but even if we don't, we need to just get started and get as many in as possible. And I like to snip off the plants and get them out of the way before I start digging. It is a pain to try to dig when the plants are all over the top. And some people say that you should wait until the frost hits them to kill the plants and then dig them. But we've just never found that that's worked for us because they're just in the ground too long. We have gotten a ton of comments about using 
sweet potato leaves in like stir fries and like in place of spinach and stuff and we haven't tried that yet so i guess while we're doing this we should give it a try All right there's the base so you want to leave no 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 you want to leave some around it so we can see where the plant is so we know where to dig one neat package it is really exciting to see what's in here look how this stuff just all moves out of the way nice and loose well that's not bad those aren't whopping big ones for sure but that skin is really nice that looks really good so that's a plus even if they're not as big as they should be oh there's more hey there's more so that's not bad from one plant so those Covington ones there, they looked really nice. There's no like blemishes and stuff like that, but they're still pretty small. I feel like we should leave them in a lo little longer. So I think we're gonna wait at least a week or so till we dig those there. But I wanna see how these Vardaman ones look right here. Again, these are looking like they look nice, but they're not big and they might not get a lot bigger. We have never really been able to grow just those really huge sweet potatoes, but I think they can get bigger than this. These leaves are still doing a whole lot of sunlight capturing, so I think they'll get a little bigger yet. We'll get these in and we'll start the curing process for these. These potatoes are ones that we dug a couple weeks ago, so they've been laying out for long enough that they should be good to stack in these crates now and store for the winter. I am noticing that some of these have kind of a brown soft spot. Our potatoes went crazy this year. It's been the best potato harvest that we've ever had. So you can imagine my disappointment when I came down here to the root cellar and found that a bunch of the Yukon gold potatoes have these odd raised bumps on them. I didn't think much of it at first, but soon the spot started to get bigger and softer and I realized it was gonna be a real problem. I was so sick about it, I right away went on Google and sifted through tons of potato fungus pictures until I found the exact one that our potatoes have. Now these are the potatoes that we just got dug recently and they need to get laid out so that they can cure. I got all the others put in crates. It's called Virus Y. I couldn't find much about this particular virus, but what I did find is that it's almost always transmitted through seed potatoes. Yukon gold potatoes are the most susceptible ones. I spend about a week feeling really discouraged and honestly like a failure. I am still learning how to deal with the feeling of sharing my mistakes with the world. I was afraid that something was wrong with our soil and that I was a bad gardener, and I'm sure some of you might think I'm being overly dramatic, but the feeling was real. Anyways, a week or so later, I was talking to my mom about my potato situation, and right away she was like, hey, my potatoes have the same thing. To make a long story short, we figured out that our potatoes had come from the same place and that sure enough, they were both Yukon Gold as well. I'm not happy that my mom's potatoes have fungus, but it was a real relief to know that it probably wasn't a big mistake on my part. So I am planning to rotate crops next year and hopefully the virus will not stay in the soil. Time will tell, but our potatoes did so well this year that we absolutely have enough to last us through the year. The main thing that looks big to me is the fact that we may have to preserve some of the potatoes with spots or they'll go to waste. This is like our second year of growing sweet corn. It's not difficult to grow, but you do have to know when to pick it and it can be kind of hard because it's like completely covered. To know if the sweet corn is ready, if the tassel is completely dried and brown, you also want to check and see if the cob is big enough. So there's some of these like this. This obviously is not going to be ready because that's not very big at all. This one here looks nice and filled out. If you still aren't sure, you can peel this back just a little bit, and if you poke a kernel with your fingernail and it's milky, that's ready. If it's watery, it's not. Honestly, this is not the greatest way of checking because if you peel that back, bugs and worms are gonna get into it. So I don't check unless I'm pretty much completely positive that the cob is ready. Gorgeous, gorgeous sweet corn. Cannot wait to eat this. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with sweet corn. I really do like it but I hate, absolutely hate, you butter it all up and you're eating it and that butter smell <laughs> is left right there on your upper lip. Can't stand that and it feels like it's there for days. Gorgeous. I'm so excited because 
Like I haven't ever grown super nice sweet corn and we didn't have any pest problems with it this year and we didn't put the dog out. I think just the presence of a dog on the property totally kept the raccoons and possums away. We didn't have any corn damage at all this year. And I'm not seeing like any worm damage. I did on some of them. Every morning or evening, usually evening actually, I will come out here and pick raspberries. The normal amount that I get in one picking is one gallon, which is a ton of raspberries. Like if you take one gallon times however many days there are in fall, it is so many raspberries. But I'm making lots of jam right now. We're so happy for the raspberries. We're eating them on our oatmeal. I'm putting them in my juice in the morning. I'm doing like everything I can think with raspberries. I actually really enjoy picking raspberries for sure for the first few weeks <laughs> that they're going. I like to um, come out here and turn a podcast on in the evenings and it's very relaxing actually. And it's funny because the kids leave me alone because they don't want to help me. So I get some quiet time out of it. The only issue that we have with our raspberries, sometimes when the berries get overripe, there will be like tiny little worms inside. I've noticed that when the weather is cooler, there's no worms in them. But another thing that I have figured out is that if I pick them as soon as they're ripe, like if I stay on top of picking them every single day, they will not have the little worms in them. There is a spray called Spinosad. That's an organic spray. And I called Berlin Seed and they said that's very effective for raspberries. I don't know if you can hear it. You probably can't on the camera, but like these raspberries are just buzzing with bees. And I'm afraid number one, that the Spinosad will kill the bees too. And the other thing is, is that raspberries are very soft and porous. And I just feel like they would soak up spray and I really just don't want to eat that. This is about three gallons of raspberries, I would say. What I like to do to be as efficient as possible is every day after I pick, I just throw the berries into a stock pot and then once I have a large amount, and then I will make just one huge batch of jam. Let me just stop right here and say, Michelle makes the best raspberry jam ever. We decided to put it in a second video though, so just click on it right here and she'll share all of her secrets with you. I mean, at least the jam making ones.